first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Gerber and Dr. Uh, Tyler for the opportunity. It is an honor to be here talking to you. Um, so what I'm going to be addressing is uh, low carb and the myths that refuse to die. So most dietary guidelines, as you know, are focused basically on reduction of sat, uh, fat, especially saturated fat. But they are very liberal with carbs, especially grains. They actually push you to eat more of them. So this very carb-centric approach is obviously not helping. You just look around. Uh, we have an epidemic of obesity, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. And there is no shortage of high-quality studies, just as Nina Teichos was saying uh, before me, uh, that a low-carb approach is effective. And yet, it struggles to be accepted by the mainstream. So the question is, why there is so much resistance to a low-carb approach? Uh, the current guidelines were develop, developed with a single focus, which is LDL cholesterol. So anything that increases it should be avoided, and anything that lowers it, we should embrace. Uh, but in, an adi in addition, there are several myths, and these myths are being perpetuated by doctors and dietitians alike regarding imaginary dangers to the kidneys, liver, bones, etc. Now, um, this is a nice segue to what Nina Teichos was, was just telling us. Uh, and see, this was written uh, about the last guidelines in 2015. Uh, and Stephen Nissen, the, the doctor that is writing about it in 2016, uh, he's not a low-carb doctor. Uh, he's, he's, he's as mainstream as it gets. But yet, he saw that a detailed review of the new guidelines, again, he's talking about the last one, uh, confirms a disturbing reality, the nearly complete absence of high-quality, randomized, controlled clinical trials studying meaningful clinical outcomes for dietary intervention. Unfortunately, the current and past U.S. dietary guidelines represent a nearly evidence-free zone. It's a strong statement, but it's true, and it seems to be true for the next one. So he continues, we reduced dietary fat, but binged on carbohydrates and became increasingly obese. Type 2 diabetes grew into an epidemic uh, that is now threatening to reverse decades of progress in coronary heart disease incidence. The obsession with low-fat diets has resulted in some extraordinary and bizarre food marketing practices. Yes, indeed. So why so much resistance to change? Because we know low carb is better to achieve and maintain weight loss. It is better to control type 2 diabetes. And it's an obvious dietary solution for the metabolic syndrome. So I'm going to propose to you that the biggest problem is not insulin resistance, it's evidence resistance. piece of the puzzle as to why this happens has to do with the many myths surrounding low carb. So let's take a look at them. I, uh, there are many. Uh, for the sake of time, I selected just four that I think are the most important. Uh, it will harm your kidneys, it will ha harm your liver, it will harm your bones, and it will, it will give you gout because it raises uric acid, all that protein. So. Patients with chronic kidney disease, they actually have trouble excreting many substances, including those that are derived from protein metabolism. So it is true that those people in end-stage kidney disease should not be put on a high-protein diet. However, we should keep in mind that a low-carb diet is not high-protein by design, although it can be. Now, just for the sake of discussion, let's suppose it is a high-protein diet, okay? Uh, I like to do an analogy uh, with heart failure and exercise. A patient that has a uh, late-stage heart failure cannot tolerate uh, exercise like, for example, going two flights of stairs. He may die, okay? But that does not mean that exercise is bad for the heart. 
So it is a logical fallacy. Very sick heart equals low exercise tolerance. That is true. But exercise does not cause heart disease. Likewise, very sick kidneys, they can't tolerate a high protein diet, but a high protein diet does not cause kidney disease, okay? Now, this is one randomized controlled trial of a low carb, high protein diet. It is not the only one, there are many, okay? But here, for example, we have a very low carb, high protein diet compared to a high carb diet. And this is the conclusion. This study provides preliminary evidence that long-term weight loss with very low-carb diet does not adversely affect renal function compared with a high-carb diet. Now, some people will object. This is a study that lasted just one year, but what if it's not bad for your kidney uh, for one year, but it will explode it in five years? So next, we are going to look at an observ observational study of patients with type 2 diabetes that are deemed to be at high risk of kidney disease. Now, we are talking about 6,000 patients followed from 2002 to 2008. In this graph, what is to the left is protective, and what is to the right is associated with a higher risk of progression to kidney disease in these patients. And I'm going to highlight Animal protein, because we all have heard that animal protein is especially bad. But see, those that consumed the most animal protein were actually less likely to progress to kidney disease. And basically, the only two kinds of foods that were associated with a bad outcome were high carbohydrate foods and deep fried fast food which shouldn't be a surprise because those patients are diabetic. And diabetic patients, why are they losing renal function? Because high blood sugar is affecting the kidney. So it's, of course, high carbohydrate foods that should be bad for them. It's not by eating beef that you make your diabetes worse. Uh, and this is not the single cherry-picked uh, study. Here we have another one. This it has more than 806,000 patient, uh, 8,600 patients uh, followed for six and a half years. And you can see that renal function uh, does not change according to the level of protein intake. But if we look at the all-cause mortality, those that eat very little protein actually die more. Uh, there is something funny about this paper because if you look at the title, <laughs> high protein intake associates with cardiovascular events, but not with loss of renal function. So they needed to find something bad about protein, okay? So these events, they are not cardiovascular death, okay? You actually die more if you eat less protein, but I think that the peer review would not take it without changing the title. Now, this is a special paper. It is special because uh, it is the only randomized control trial I could find that is actually testing a higher protein diet on patients that have already established kidney disease. The diet they were trying uh, cut carbs by half, but uh, protein was not restricted. It is a multiple intervention diet, so there is also reducing uh, iron on the diet, and they are also increasing polyphenols uh, in the diet. So it's hard to say what is actually doing good here because there, it's several interventions. But uh, keep in mind, it's half the carbs, but it's liberal on the protein side. And the control diet was the standard low protein diet usually prescribed for this kind of patients. So almost 200 patients. The mean creatinine was 1.8, which means these guys had at least moderate kidney disease. And they were randomized. And the endpoints here were hard endpoints, by which I mean dialysis or death. And the mean follow-up was four years. Now, 65% carbohydrates, and the diet that was being tested was 35. 
protein was 25 to 30 percent, so it's, it was actually pretty high protein. And they drank wine. <laughs> so the results are stunning. This is a 19% absolute risk reduction. So uh, keep in mind that usually when people take statins for uh, primary prevention, we are talking about at most a 1% risk reduction, 1%. This is a 19% risk reduction for dialysis or death with a diet that did the opposite of what the guidelines tells you to do. It is uh, uh, free in terms of protein, it restricts carbs, and you can see the difference. Uh, this is a very recent paper. It is not a randomized control trial, but it's interesting because uh, they were trying a very low calorie ketogenic diet, and this diet was 1.4 grams of protein per kilogram weight. So it was considered a high protein diet. Now, interestingly, 27% of patients with mild renal failure reported normalization of glomerular filtrate after dietary intervention. So this paper is hinting to us that some patients, as they lose weight, as they be make their metabolic syndrome better, they can actually reverse a mild uh, renal failure uh, with diet. So, it seems that no, not only a low-carb diet is not uh, bad for your kidneys, but it may, may be actually good in terms of reversing disease. So I think we slashed that one. Liver. There is a persistent myth that a low-carb diet will somehow force or harm your liver. You probably heard that. The funny thing is there is nothing in the peer review literature that even hints at that possibility. And uh, it, it, you should do it if you are in, in the health profession. Just do a PubMed search, put the relevant uh, keywords. You won't find anything implying a low carb or even a high protein diet in harming the, the liver, okay? On the contrary, when you look at the animal studies, there are many, but if can, you can summarize them uh, like this. Excess sugar, fructose, in the diet leads to fat production and accumulation in the liver. And uh, Dr. Lustig has uh, looked and told us in exquisite detail about that. Less carbs means less fatty liver. More protein also means less fatty liver. But what about in humans? Then again, uh, Dr. Lustig showed us a lot of uh, data in his presentation. I encourage you to uh, look back at that presentation. If you are looking from home, you can look at his video. Uh, also, uh, this is the, his website where you will, it will take you a while just to browse through all the papers that he's published. We are looking at the seventh, 70th one, okay? He showed in his presentation that adolescents with fatty liver uh, could have a big reduction in the fat content of their liver in less than 10 days with a low sugar diet. I'm going to show you just one trial, because this trial made a lot of news. It was published in Cell Metabolism. And the thing to keep in mind here is uh, as it was said before in this conference, many times people will argue, okay, your fatty liver got better, but it's because you lost weight. Uh, as if it was a bad thing, okay? But anyway, <laughs> it's because you lost weight. Uh, so here they did a, a isocaloric diet and made their best effort to keep people with uh, weight stable, okay? Uh, in a diet that is low carb, and high protein. So according to the myth, this should be bad for your liver. It's low carb and high protein. And what we saw was a dramatic reduction of liver fat in two weeks. So the weight was, although some people lost a little bit of weight, and it was hard to keeping them from losing weight, even with more than 3,000 calories a day.
on a low carb diet, but the liver fat went down like 25%. Okay, what about bone health? It's another ur urban legend that low carb, which is supposedly high protein, would lead to osteoporosis, and why should it? Because all this protein, they tell you, will result in an acidic metabolism, and that acid needs to be tamponated, needs to be controlled by calcium and phosphorus, which reside in our bones. Well, one fact, and this is a physiology, physiology fact, is that what you eat does not significantly change your body pH, which is kept at a very narrow range. Uh, actually, uh, the, the pH needs to be at this very narrow range. Those that work in ICUs know very well that uh, larger fluctuations will lead to pretty bad outcomes. Okay, so our body cannot be influenced in terms of pH by what we eat. And important, what controls that pH are the kidneys and the lungs, not the bones. So, why was this myth put forward in the first place? The thing is, people with chronic metabolic acidosis, they do lose bone mass. But those people, they have kidney disease. It's not because they ate a steak, okay? Again, when the kidneys are functioning fine, they regulate the body's pH by modifying the urine's pH so that you won't make your blood either acidic or alkaline. Now look at this graph. It shows you that yes, indeed, if you put people on a high protein diet after they were on a low protein diet, there is an in increased excretion of calcium in the urine. So people say, aha, see, when you eat more protein, you are losing calcium. And the calcium is coming from where? Obviously from the bone. Not really. Because if you look at how they absorb calcium from their diets, what people found out is that once you put someone in a high protein diet, it increases the absorption of calcium. So you become more efficient in absorbing the calcium that you are eating. And if you are absorbing more calcium, it's obvious that you're gonna excrete more. So this highlights a problem with nutrition. People extrapolate from mechanisms, like nobody cared to actually look if the calcium was coming from the bones or not. They just assumed it was from the bones. And then you have this myth that low carb is going to give you osteoporosis. I like this paper because it has the most descriptive title ever. A diet high in meat protein and, protein and potential renal acid load increases fractional calcium absorption and urinary calcium excretion without affecting markers of bone resorption or formation. You don't even need to, need to read the, the, the abstracts, <laughs> right? Now, uh, this is uh, as mainstream as it gets. This is the National Osteoporosis Foundation, and it's a systematic review and meta-analysis, which should put the myth to the rest, okay? Although the scientific literature is somewhat limited with regards to the beneficial effects of protein intake, our analysis does not indicate the presence of any adverse relations. And the body of evidence shows that if the effect of dietary protein on the skeleton appears to be favorable. And the conclusion is no adverse effects of higher protein di in in diets intakes and positive trends, positive trends on bone mass density at most bone sites. So it's actually good for you. Okay, what about gout? Gout, as you know, is very painful. It's a painful condition. Uh, it's an arthritis uh, that uh, occurs because uh, you have uric acid crystals that precipitate, that form inside the joint. And it is said to be due to much red meat and seafood. Patients are told to avoid too much protein. Hence, there is a myth that a low-carb diet will worsen or cause gout. Well, first we need to understand that a high uric acid uh, level is common 
in people with gout, but people with a high seric uric acid, will, uh, some of them will never develop the disease. So to have a high uric acid level is necessary but not sufficient for you to have gout. Now, I went to the UK Gout Society to see what they recommend for you not to eat. You should avoid organ meats, you should avoid game, you should avoid oily fish and seafood and meat. So basically, you cannot eat anything that is nutrient dense. <laughs> now, what should you eat instead? Plenty of fruit, at least five a day. Plenty of bread, other cereals, and potatoes, and moderate amounts of meat, fish, and alternatives. So it's the road to obesity and diabetes. It's basically that, OK? Now, it is interesting because um, all physicians know that gout is very, very closely associated with the metabolic syndrome. So why on earth would I tell somebody with the metabolic syndrome to eat this and expect him to get better? So what about science? Because all we have been telling is people say this organiza organization says, but you know, what about science? The evidence to avoid meat is purely epidemiological. Again, nutritional epidemiology, something akin to astrology. Okay? <laughs> the great majority of purines, purines are the, uh, the things that are the precursors of the uric acid. The great majority of the purines are endogenous, meaning they are made by your body, just like cholesterol. And the purine restriction, the diet that I showed you, we reduce uric acid by no more than 1.5 milligrams per deciliter, which is clinically irrelevant when people actually follow it, which is never, because it's basically impossible to follow that, that, that diet. Now, this is very interesting. Look at this. Dietary management of gout, what is the evidence? There were only three randomized controlled trials testing this gout diet, this low purine, high carbohydrate diet, and none have shown benefit. Now let that sink in. We have only three randomized control trials that have ever uh, analyzed the diet that is widely prescri prescribed for gout, and they are all negative. So there's no science behind it. They do say here that weight loss is good, that avoidance of sugary drinks is good, that reduction of alcohol is good. And I couldn't agree more. We caution about translating findings from observational and interventional studies of healthy volunteers without gout into treatment recommendations for those with established disease. So this is, again, is the same problem with nutrition science. People do nutrition epidemiology, then they extrapolate by mechanisms, and they never get to test if the thing actually works. Dr. Lustig showed us, again, in very detail, a lot of biochemistry, why fructose increases your uric acid. It actually needs a lot of ATP, and this a, this adenine, is a purine. So when the body needs to metabolize a lot of fructose, it will increase your endogenous production of uric acid. And this is nicely shown here. This is once you ingest sugar or high fructose corn, sugar, uh, corn uh, syrup, you have in, an acute increase in uric acid. And those things, sugar and corn syrup, they don't have any purines. They are not protein. They are not meat. Now, this is an actual trial. It's a pilot study. OK, it's a small one. But look, they were doing a moderate limitation of calorie and carbohydrates and increased proportional intake of protein. So according to the dogma, these people with gout should become worse off once we give them more protein and less carbs. So what happened? 
basically everybody had a reduction in their uric acid after 16 weeks. But what is more interesting, they had a huge reduction in the number of gout attacks with more protein and less carbs. Now, if we understand that a high uric acid and gout are associated with the metabolic syndrome, then this makes sense. And this is the best one, because it's the Atkins diet, okay? Everybody will tell you that the Atkins diet will give you gout because it's rich in protein, red meat, seafood, very low in carbohydrates. Um, this has never been published, and I wonder why. Okay, uh, I, I f found it uh, as, an, as an abstract. This, I believe, is the American um, College of Rheumatology. Um, and uh, the, the data comes from a very well-known um, uh, paper, randomized control trial, uh, the direct trial from 2008 that was published in the New England Journal comparing a low carb, a low fat, and a Mediterranean diet showing what you should expect that a low carb diet was better. But they got a subgroup of those patients and did the uric acid analysis, and this is what I'm going to show you. The results were more remarkable in patients that had uric acids above seven in this group. The more obese and younger, the greater the benefit with the Atkins diet. And here again, you see the baseline, and six months after, you have a great decrease in the uric acid levels. I should tell you uh, that it, this is probably a biphasic thing. So at first, uric acid may go up, and then it goes down. Here, they're just showing you two data points. And now we are going, becoming, uh, we are starting to see uh, news like this. Could a ketogenic diet alleviate gout? So we have gone from this certainly is bad for you and causes gout to should we use it to treat it? So can we fix the nutritional guidelines? Well, we just saw Nina Taichos uh, making for us a um, dire <laughs> evaluation of that. Uh, Brazil has, since 2014, uh, has the most revolutionary food guidelines in the world. Uh, instead of focusing on particular nutrients like food pyramids or my plate, uh, it's focused on processed and ultra-processed foods and the food industry. Uh, and they made these 10 steps to a healthy diet, and I'm going to highlight just a few of them. Make natural or minimally processed foods the basis of your diet. Limit consumption of processed foods and avoid consumption of ultra-processed foods. Shopping places that offer a variety of natural or minimally processed foods. And be wary of food advertising and marketing. So why do we care about the US or the UK guidelines in Brazil? We care because these guidelines have a huge influence in the way nutrition is taught around the world. Dietitians are still being taught that saturated fats clog your arteries, that starchy food is okay for everybody, uh, including the obese or diabetics, and that processed low-fat food is good for you. We need to fight to break the evidence-free sp spell of modern nutrition. So in conclusion, low-carb is not a high-protein protein diet, but even if it were, it would not harm the kidneys. It is not a high-protein diet, but if, even if it were, it would still be good for the liver. Low-carb is not a high-protein diet, but even if it were, it would be good for bone health. And low-carb is not the only healthy approach to nutrition, but it should be included in the guidelines as a tool to be offered by healthcare providers. Thank you.